Prime Time Local News, serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. With Saskatchewan officially starting its reopen plan, Lloydminster is one of the cities not included in that for now. I sit down with Colleen, MLA Colleen Young rather, to get reaction on the recent COVID-19 outbreak at the Lloydminster Hospital, as well as the plan to restart the economy. All right, I'm very pleased to be joined with MLA Colleen Young. Colleen, first off, thanks a lot for joining me. You're welcome. Good morning to you. Let's talk about, um, we know Scott Moe announced that Lloydminster is now officially not part of the reopen phase plan due to the COVID-19 outbreaks. So how disappointing is it in your mind knowing that the city's not part of that reopen phase? Well, I, I know that there's still ongoing conversations between um, myself and the mayor and the premier with regards to what that might look like for Lloydminster. Yes, it was very disappointing after the outbreak was announced last week that we would not be um, opening up with the rest of the province um, until things get a little bit more under control here. But I know that, you know, there's still the chance that, you know, it may be next week or whatever, depending on, on uh, how our cases um, pan out. It, uh, it is a challenge for our small businesses and local community, as I know that people are anxious to, to start, you know, seeing their customers again. But I think everybody understands how important it is for everyone to stay safe and, and to ensure that our healthcare system is, is healthy. Do you believe that the plan that Scott Moe has in place for Saskatchewan, do you believe the plan is, is solid, like has a solid foundation? I believe so. Um, the uh, conversations I have had um, with the re rest of my fellow caucus, we have conversations um, through uh, conference calls and um, WebEx um, on Wednesday mornings. And uh, it had to be a plan that was controllable and manageable moving forward. We don't want to have to shut everything down again if all of a sudden there's mass outbreaks all over the province. But I think that the plan that we did come up with allows us to do gradual openings, even though we are probably going to see more cases as we move forward. Um, I think it's manageable and controllable and allows our economy to get restarted. Have you had a chance to hear from some citizens and some business owners here in the community about their concerns and how they feel this whole process has been going for them? Have you heard anything from them? Oh, absolutely. I was on a call just a little over a week ago with about 20 um, businesses from the oil sector talking about what things look like for them. We wanted to get uh, the Minister of Energy and Resources was online with us and she wanted to get a feel for what they've been going through, the layoffs they've had to do, what this might look like for them as we do reopen the province and move forward and what that is, um, what they're going to have to do along with us to work in partnership to, to get the industry back up and going. But I've also heard from other small business owners and it is going to be a challenge for some because restrictions are still in place and there still needs to be restrictions in place. So some of them will find it a lot more challenging than others. Some have been putting things in place already with the plan um, to reopen sometime in the future. So they will be ready when the time comes. Now, of course, the Saskatchewan Health Authority came out last week amidst that COVID outbreak at the hospital saying, you know, they made a mistake not releasing the Lloyd Minster numbers. Do you believe still that the, the Saskatchewan Health Authority is doing a good job in giving us that information? Well, I've been advocating right from the get-go when we started shutting things down that Lloyd Minster should have received um, a little bit different treatment in the fact that, you know, we have Alberta Health Services uh, in our community, as well as Saskatchewan Health Authority, even though we fall under Saskatchewan Health Authority, I think there's a bit of a challenge in making sure our numbers are accurate, as um, you know, we do have residents who may have been tested in Edmonton, Vermilion, someplace else, and not necessarily reported in our Sask Health numbers. So it's been a challenge right from the get go, I think, in ensuring that those numbers are accurate. I think Saskatchewan Health Authority has done their very best in order to record the numbers that they get. But I think that having us lumped into numbers that reach all the way from the Alberta border across to the Manitoba border um, created some of the, the massive concerns we've had with um, my constituents and the residents of this community. 
And have you had a chance to chat with the Saskatchewan Health Authority just on that level of, you know, getting that, getting those numbers and getting accurate information? I've had ongoing conversations with our Minister of Rural and Remote Health on uh, this issue and provided any time I've gotten any concerns uh, from constituents or residents in Lloydminster, those have been passed on to them. So they've been well aware that there has been um, concerns raised here right from the very beginning back in March. And uh, uh, we were constantly being told to tell our residents just to assume that it was here, that it was in your community, that your neighbors had it, um, if nothing else. And, and I think um, the, the communication lines were maybe not as clear and as tight as they could have been from SHA. I don't directly talk with SHA. Our health ministers are relying on information that they get from the Saskatchewan Health Authority, our chief medical officer, Dr. Shahab, and the officials. And those are the, the numbers and communications that we get as MLAs in our communities. And I guess just lastly, you know, today, of course, was supposed to be the first day of, you know, reopen for here in Lloydminster. Are you still optimistic that, you know, hopefully somewhere down the line, maybe in weeks or maybe even months, that we could be a part of the reopen phase? I'm very optimistic that it won't be very long before we will be included in the in the reopening phases. I know that as of today, our mayor uh, sent a letter to uh, Scott Livingston, the CEO of the Saskatchewan Health Authority, in particularly around um, keeping the lines of communication uh, for Lloydminster uh, very clear as well as keeping us on the radar for reopen and not forgetting about us as can happen as we all know here and and i myself will be constantly talking in regards to that as well to the premier and to uh, the rural and remote health minister to ensure that lloyd minster isn't forgotten in the reopen plan absolutely well colleen i really appreciate your time thank you very much for joining me you're welcome connor stay safe stay healthy and have a good day now for this week's retrospect here's blake neve retrospect. The Border City Airport prepares for their first ever air show. Early this morning the Border City Airport was quiet but that's about to change. The first ever air show is about to take flight and preparations are underway to make sure that things run smoothly. Showers near the mountains Saturday mainly sunny with a few cloud cloudy periods. On a normal day flight service specialists at the airport deal with about 50 to 100 takeoffs and landings but tomorrow will be a different story. It, it, it's hard to say. It's our first air show that we've ever worked, and uh, I, I would expect in the neighborhood of maybe around four to five hundred movements uh, for for the entire day. To deal with tomorrow's increase in air traffic, all flight service specialists will be working. A every single operator here, a uh, complement of nine, will be working sometime throughout the day. Uh, normally, we can work this uh, this station single stand, sometimes two on. Uh, very rarely we have three. Uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, three to four on all day. And Lloyd Minster put on a fashion show for Aboriginal designers from the prairies. The show featured fashions from Aboriginal designers across the prairies. And while school officials started the ball rolling on the event, most of it was student organized. Students cook, uh, they decorate, uh, they do the hair, the makeup, uh, setting up tables. Uh, they just they're beside us 100% throughout the whole whole thing. I guess to come show the youth, the children, be I guess a role model, inspiration. Because um, I see a bit of them, they're real interested in this sort of thing. Eh? So it's pretty good being here. And that's all for this week in retrospect. Retrospect this week is brought to you by Webb's Ford. Worth your while to drive the extra mile. Webb's Ford in Vermilion.
Today I'm joined here with Tanya and Mitch LeBlanc, the owners of Art Soul Life Creative Studio here in Lloydminster. And today we're going to be talking just a little bit about their at-home kits and a little bit about homemade masks that they are offering online. So thank you so much for joining me today. First, let's start off with how your business has been doing since having to close and what you're offering to people at home. Well, thanks for having us. Um, our business is now offering uh, to-go kits in the form of pottery painting or canvas painting. Um, we're also offering our Creative Friend, which is a similar concept to Build a Bear to take home. Um, we pivoted quite quickly, like many other businesses in town. So that's something you can just do all online with um, no contact pickup or delivery here in the city of Lloyd. Now, with the pottery, are you still firing uh, people's artwork or do, would they have to wait until you're fully opened again? Yeah, so any of the pottery pieces that go out, uh, we send uh, the glazes, the brushes and the little instruction guide. And then um, they bring them back to us once they're finished, uh, anytime we're open. And then we kind of quarantine them for a couple days and then we get them into the kiln and fire them and then we call them again to come pick up. Now, I was reading on your website that you strive to foster imagination and creativity in others. So why is it important to have those at-home kits offered to those artistic people here in Lloyd? Well, realistically, art is therapeutic. And um, we all know that what we're going through collectively together is very stressful for a lot of people. And it's just something we feel like is imperative that people still have some sort of creative outlet. Um, it's a great option for kids um, out of school with the option to do a little bit of artwork at home. But really, we just we just really want people to be in a good mental space. And if we can help them with that by giving them an outlet and that creative option, then that's what we're here for right now. And do you have any plans for when you are allowed to reopen? And if so, what are kind of uh, some of the uh, setups that you'll have in place once you are allowed to reopen? Well, it depends on where we fall in the phases for where we open that we're looking at trying to get some more clarification on that. But um, initially when we start, um, obviously the large gatherings, birthday parties and stuff, we won't be able to do. Um, and we'll have our walk-in open. We've just done some renovations since we've been closed. So uh, we'll have the ability to separate people and have them seated for walk-in. Um, and we're looking at doing more of a reservation style. Um, so that we can actually know when people are going to come and we can have tables and everything reserved for them. So uh, we'll make it a little bit uh, less challenging in that aspect. And so now recently you have been offering homemade masks on your website. Tell me a little bit about that process and uh, where you started offering that. So uh, the studio itself is actually owned by Mitch and myself as well as my parents. Um, my mom does a lot of the background work um, with accounting and stuff and she likes to sew as a hobby and so she started sewing and one day we were kind of thinking geez we could probably sell some of these at the studio and her thoughts were just getting as many out the door as we can and mm -hmm. and so we're we're selling them basically for what she's kind of costing her to make them but it's just more about getting them into the hands of the people that need them right now and so it is an option right online you can order you can pick different sizes and um you know what gender you're ordering for and we'll try and match it up as best we can and you just pop in and pick up a bag and they're ready to go and now all in all, your homemade, your at-home pa uh, painting kits, the pottery kits and the masks, how has that all been doing uh, business-wise? Has people really been responding to those creativ create creativity uh, packages? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, obviously we're not as busy as we were when we were open, but um, we were getting a lot more new people uh, that are contacting us and looking at and finding stuff on our website. Um, and not only that, we're also doing online classes with uh, clay hand building and we're mm -hmm. doing Zoom classes and we're recording videos so people can pick up to go clay kits and actually do that as well. So it's a, uh, it's something that we're looking at actually keeping uh, when we do open up our doors uh, and just continuing on into the future. And really quickly before we wrap up, uh, where can people find all this information? And if they uh, would like to contact you, how can they do so? 
So right now the studio is only open uh, Mondays, Thursdays and Saturdays from 1130 to 230. So you can contact the studio directly during those hours or by Facebook is probably the quickest way for us to get back to you. Our online store is just on our website, which is our full name. So artsoullifecreativestudio.ca. And there's a shop page there, really simple to use, super user friendly, and you can order right online there. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, taking time out to talk to me. Awesome, thank you so much, thank Abby. You. Furniture set and design supplied by Furniture Gallery and Furniture House, downtown Lloydminster. I'm joined here with Janice Davenport and she has been recently making masks for healthcare workers in the border city. So how did you really start on making these masks? Well, it all started, I guess, when I was making quilts for our son and daughter and I ended up having um, quite a bit of fabric left over and of course all the information coming through on internet with regards to mass making i thought hey why i should contact the healthcare workers and see if maybe they could do some and you like and you that, said oh sorry that's okay and like you mentioned you know you wanted to reach out to the healthcare workers why did you think that was really important to do so well they're working like working on the front lines as they are, they're putting their lives on the line. And I just thought that maybe with added protection that perhaps it would help. So that's why I thought that they could use this. And have you been making more than just masks? I have been, I also made some scrub bags for the hospital, for the x-ray department. Um, I had received the, uh, a message from one of the workers there and I thought that she maybe she was needing masks but she said that uh, instead of masks uh, they could use scrub bags so with the uh, was running a little low on fabric so uh, I had a friend of mine donate some so I was able to make them the, uh, the amount of bags that they were required. And like you mentioned, you just you talked with someone at the hospital about what they really need. So how did you really get into more of a contact into donating these to the hospital? Uh, basically, it was just um, I just approached some of the workers there and asked if they were interested in the masks. And they said, sure, if you make them, we'll be sure to use them. So I made a batch and dropped them off. And I guess they all got gobbled up really quickly. And what has the response been from them so far? Uh, it's been really positive. Um, as a result of making the ones for the hospital, um, I got calls from friends and family who also wanted more. And I also made some for the co-op health care um, center. So I was contacted to make some for them as well. So however many they needed is how many I donated. And what does it mean for you to be able to see the community supporting each other through like these masks? Uh, it's been um, it's been really really wonderful, and like I say, I've been making them for. I've made over eighty masks that I've donated so far. A lot of them are being used um, just for grocery shopping or whatever the people feel they need to use them for. And um, like I said, I've made over 80 and donated them. People ask, why won't I charge? And I said, I don't feel right charging anybody at this time because it is such a, it is like such a, a needed thing, I think, not the right word to use, but yeah, everybody can uh, certainly use those to try and protect themselves from this uh, coronavirus. That's awesome. And like you mentioned to me before, you said that you aren't really doing this for the accolades and you just really want to help out the community. That is correct. Yes. I, when I set out, I just, just being who I am, I guess, I just decided why not do this. And like I say, um, after starting to do it and people got word that I was making these then they would contact me to make more. So, um, I have made a few for the elderly. Um, yeah. 
And if someone was looking to contact you regarding these masks, how can they do so? Uh, they could just, I guess, um, through my Facebook page, uh, Janice Davenport, or um, they could call me at 780-871-4905. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this, Janice. Oh, you are very welcome. You have a wonderful day, and everybody out there, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Joining me today is Eric Bay from the station, here to talk a little bit about the NFL football, especially the quarterback scenario going on right now. Eric, how's it going? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? Good, thank you. Excited to, to get down and uh, talk some football. So uh, let's just kick it off here right now uh, with the New Orleans Saints. Uh, they signed a quarterback who we've heard some controversy about, uh, especially with his interceptions uh, in the previous seasons. That's Jameis Winston. Uh, Eric, what are your thoughts on this signing? It's an interesting move, and I think it's really low risk, you know, and a possibility of a high reward. Obviously, Drew Brees was hurt last year, and you look at what Teddy Bridgewater did when he came in in relief. I'm not sure that they will get that ability out of him when he does come in into the uh, into the rep room. But again, it is a good chance and low signing, low money. So it does look like it could be pretty promising for them. And also a chance for Jameis Winston, too, to learn from Drew Brees and Sean Payton, two of the best minds in football right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, Winston, he's a high-risk, high-reward kind of quarterback. Uh, he said he got LASIK eye surgery over the summer, so maybe that'll help him. Because one thing that he did mention was his depth perception uh, was off. Now, Eric, as a quarterback, you'd think that depth perception is the most important thing, no? Yeah, well, we've talked about this, too. And obviously, when you have receivers running down the field, Depth perception is the difference between hitting them perfect and throwing it five yards down the field to the safety over the top for an interception. So I don't think that can be blamed for all his interception troubles, but it, it can't hurt, obviously. And again, your eyes are pretty important trying to see that field as a quarterback. And we mentioned Teddy Bridgewater, who came in to uh, help out the Saints when Breeze was out. Bridgewater uh, is now going to take over for Cam Newton. Uh, Cam Newton's probably the most interesting quarterback still left in free agency. Eric, why do you think teams haven't picked him up? Well, I think a lot of teams have their quarterback situation pretty much settled. I think the only only few teams that really could use a quarterback are obviously you look at teams like the New England Patriots, the Jacksonville Jaguars, and especially the Chicago Bears. So I think a lot of teams really, it's not much of an upgrade if you do sign him in free agency. And I guess it all really depends on to what he's looking for money-wise, because that might be an issue too. Obviously, a lot of teams are tied against the cap. And a lot of teams, there was a good quarterback draft this year too at the top. So he's not really one of those higher end options. So what I see for him is possibly once some injuries do hit here, if the season does start as scheduled, is look kind of that first month of the season. And he might be picked up there as, as somebody to replace some of those injuries. Because again, I'm not sure at this point if he's really an upgrade if you do sign him over what a lot of these other teams have. Another worry of mine is his potential of being probably a, a locker room problem. You've seen how he interacts with some of the media, even just the way he conducts and carries himself. Uh, you know, that's something that could be looked at by teams added on to the money problems and whatnot. Another team that's having some money problems, the Dallas Cowboys, and they did not make things easier for themselves by signing Andy Dalton, the 32-year-old quarterback, formerly with the Bengals. Eric, what are your thoughts on that signing? I think it's, again, I think it's pretty low risk. I think the timing is what's most interesting, and I'm obviously not a guy who's going to read into things too much. But it kind of tells me, I guess, if you want to hype it up a little bit, that when, especially when a guy like Dak Prescott isn't signed right now, that it could say that Jerry Jones is willing to hold out because obviously Dak Prescott wants that big time $30 million money of a starting star quarterback, and he hasn't really shown that yet. But I feel like this is kind of Jerry Jones signaling that, hey, we'll go with the, I guess, kind of proven option. He's dependable. He can get the job done he'll be serviceable and then they'll hold out and, and see what happens if they can get that number down for Dak Prescott. Now does Dak Prescott do you think he deserves that kind of money you know we're talking Aaron Rodgers Russell Wilson kind of money is he quite in that tier yet? Well I don't think most of those guys who are in that tier 
belong in that tier. So I'm going to say no. And you look at guys like Kirk Cousins and what he did in Washington, he didn't really do much. I don't think they ever made the playoffs with him at quarterback. And yet he still got about $28 million a season from the Vikings. So for me, no, he definitely doesn't. He obviously hasn't had the sustained playoff success. And again, also you look at the weapons around him, it's all about is he making those weapons better or are the weapons making him better? So for me, it's it's not worth it. But again, it's what the market has set when you look at these guys. You mentioned Rodgers. You talk Matt Ryan, some of these guys, $30 million a season. It's what the market dictates. And the problem with the Cowboys, too, is they are up against the cap with Ezekiel Elliott's new contract, Amari Cooper as well. So they're in some trouble right now. Now switching gears here uh, quickly, uh, one of the NFL greatest coaches of all time, Don Shula, passed away. Uh, 90 years old, uh, one of the best known for uh, his undefeated season, only undefeated season in the NFL. Um, Eric, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, obviously just a great legend of the game, and a lot of people nowadays talk Bill Belichick is the greatest coach of all time, but I think they kind of forget what exactly Don Shula did for the game with the Baltimore Colts and the Miami Dolphins. 33 seasons as an NFL head coach, only two losing seasons, and he's the winningest head coach of all time. And you mentioned he went to six Super Bowls, one, two, and then obviously the cherry on top, that only undefeated season with the Dolphins, 1972. So just a, a great motivator, a great coach, a good offensive mind, and just an ambassador for, for his 90 years on the planet here for the NFL. So he will be sorely missed by the NFL community. And our thoughts and prayers go out to his family. Eric? Thank you, as always, for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to be ba being back in studio. So I'm joined here with Joyce, uh, and she's a local business owner, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Girl Guy Cookies campaign. Uh, there's been some kind of interesting developments because obviously uh, they had to change the way they sell the cookies, and some local businesses, including Sobeys and others, have had to step up and sell them. So Joyce, let's just start with, can you tell me a little bit about how your business is helping sell these cookies? Um, essentially, we're, we're buying the cookies and we're selling them online. Um, Girl Guides really wants to promote no door to door for the girls, of course, obviously for safety reasons. Um, because my business does do door to door deliveries, um, I did ask permission to see if that was all right if we did that and they said, yeah, that's fine. So um, just because I'm not putting myself into any more harm than I would normally on a regular business day. So yeah, so we have them up online. We have both kinds, the mint and the classic cookies. You can purchase them online and then we show up at your door with cookies. That's awesome. That sounds really cool. And you say you buy all of them and then you're giving 100% of the money back to the girl guys, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I usually buy about 10 cases at a time. Once I'm sold out of those, I'll buy 10 more and the money goes straight to the unit, unit that I'm buying them from. And uh, typically the girls, how would they sell the cookies on a normal year? Normally, they would go door to door or they would set up a booth at um, co-op marketplace. That's kind of a main place in town that they sell. Um, so they're not able to do that now. So they need to find a way to do it. So um, obviously, national and provincial has asked Sobeys and Safeway and the bigger organizations like that to um, sell the cookies for them. Um, but they do need to have... Um, some more outlets, right? So some of what national and province is doing is they're focusing on the classic cookies, but there is units that still have mint left over. So um, leaders are kind of worried. They're like, what are we gonna do with these cookies? So um, it's an easy way for small businesses to buy a case and give it to their customers, or they can resell it um, for the same amount that they paid. So $5 a box, they purchase the case, they can sell the case and it just goes to help the girls. And what does the money go towards when they sell the cookies? How does it help the girls here in Lloydminster? It goes to various things. So it'll go to um, camps, it'll go to unit supplies. Um, 
our unit right now, they're doing a trip, which, which was supposed to happen this summer, but has now, of course, been postponed. Um, so there's a, a variety um, of things that they can use it for. There is girls that um, they may not have the, the financial means to pay for camp, so the units help out, and that's where the funds go. And have you received a lot of uh, people trying to buy their cookies through your business? We have. It's been really good. Um, I posted, I believe, Saturday, and I think um, I think I'm sitting at. I've sold about 20 cases already. So people are are wanting to. They want the cookies. Um, they just didn't know how to get them. So the more businesses in the community we have selling them, the better. That's awesome. And if someone is watching this and they want to be able to buy them through your business or what have you, how can they get in touch with you and how are they able to buy those cookies? Um, the best way is to go through our website, which is um, soupdujar.ca. So S-O-U-P-D-U-J-A-R.ca. You can find them on there. You can personally message me on my Facebook page um, and reach out to me there. Same name, Soup du Jar. And we can get you in contact with um, one case or 10 cases or however many you want, even if it's just a few boxes. That's awesome. And just before we go, I just wanted to ask about, you're obviously a small business owner and things have been difficult for business owners during this time. So uh, are you selling your own products online as well? And are people able to buy your products online during this uh, kind of crazy time? Yes, we are. We've got our um, soups online. So there are frozen pre-made soups. So um, you can take them home and reheat them. We've also got our line of popcorns on there that we sell. And as well, um, any soups that we do sell, we're currently giving to, um, we have a buy one, give one program going. So any package purchased, we're donating to the local food banks. And we've done, I think, about 400 packages so far to the, the local organizations here. That's awesome. Yeah. And thanks for taking some time to talk to me today. And thanks for calling.